All right, so today we're doing a 2JZ GE BBTI into an IS200. Uh, this is a unique one. We've actually taken a GS300 engine harness and we've repinned it out because the customer sourced an IS300 ECU. So let's get into it. Right, so as discussed, this is obviously a 2JZ GE VBTI. It is going into an IS200 for a swap. It is using a J160 manual gearbox. Um, as I said, quite a unique one because we've actually taken, the customer had, for some reason, a GS300 engine harness. Um, he managed to get his hands on an IS300 ECU so we could take advantage of the remapping. And we've obviously repinned the entire harness to work on an IS300 ECU. That's why you can see this is obviously different because there's a GS300 plug, not an IS300 plug there. But again, same scenario, it's just a junction box and it can clip in down here on that one. First thing we're going to do, obviously, so uh, Jamie can see everything and where it goes. We're just going to run through the entire layout and where everything is plugged in and where it goes to. So starting in the ECU box, again, it's just your two plugs over here from a standard IS200 uh, engine harness that should remain inside the vehicle when you remove the 1GFE engine. Then obviously we've got the ECU itself, so we've got the three plugs that come from the engine harness itself into here. We then got the two body plugs, which obviously form part of the resin patch over there. There are a couple of wires that need to come from here going into the harness itself. Then coming down here, we've got the body plug, so we've got the plug over there, the plug over there, and the plug over there. Now these are all three different plugs, so you can't actually plug them in the wrong ones. You don't need to stress about that. And same applies to the ECU. All of these five plugs are completely different. You can't put the wrong one into the wrong plug, so no dramas there at all. And then lastly, we've got obviously the junction box, which can just clip in at the bottom over there. Now obviously you'll see missing from here, we don't have the uh, MPX converter, because obviously IS200 to IS200, they use the same MPX language. But in this case, we have remapped it. So we don't require the Atomu device, so all the automatic gearbox uh, software has been removed from the ECU. We've also removed the secondary O2 sensors, so they're gone. We've raised the RPM limit to 7,000. Uh, we've increased power slightly, and obviously she runs absolutely fine now, even though she's got a manual gearbox on because the entire software is gone. So the actual running engine software is no longer looking for that and putting it into a limp mode without the gearbox there. Uh, we've also improved the throttle response, so it's something I didn't mention on the video previously, we've done two at the same time basically. So we have improved the throttle response on this particular ECU as well, so I know it's a lot of complaints from the IS300 guys, and even the IS200 guys, but unfortunately nothing we can do about that, but is the lack of throttle response, so this should hopefully rectify that, and hopefully we'll hear back from these guys and make sure that they're happy with the setup that they've got. Right, so once we're done inside the ECU box, and last final thing, you'll see it's an IS200 ECU box here, the IS300 ECU, uh, unfortunately has a lip around here so it doesn't allow it to go all the way in so as per usual same as a 3uz which has the same style of ecu two options either you can source an is300 ecu box then this will drop straight in that's obviously the best solution second solution is you can undo the four screws here pull out the pcb board and then you can just grind this whole lip down and then this actually pushes all the way in and it'll function perfectly fine just like that all right so those are two options when it comes to that so after the ECU, we go to the grommet, and obviously the grommet just goes into there. Once we come out the grommet, it's gonna go down a fair section, and then here you're gonna have your igniter coming out. So that's going straight to over there. So that just plugs in over there, and the igniter can be grounded over here exactly like you'd see on an IS300, all right? Once we go down from there, you're gonna come up the rubber here, and then it's gonna be where it first starts bolting onto the engine. So you've got your plastic section that goes over the top, you've got your plastic section that goes along the back underneath the intake manifold here, and then we've got a section that pops down going to a bunch of stuff. What I'm gonna do is we're gonna start by going down, then we're gonna go that way, and then we're gonna go over the top. So let's move our way down from here, and you can see the plastic comes down, and then it breaks out there, and then obviously your harness comes out there. Once you come down there, it's gonna go down a little bit. I'm just gonna move this out the way quickly. It's gonna come down a bit about there and it's gonna break out and obviously it's going to go to your coolant temp sensor over there. Bear in mind, you shouldn't see this coolant temp sensor. That's a JZX100 coolant temp sensor. We fit those when we do aftermarket ECUs for 2JZ into IS200 so we can get a coolant temp for our analog MPX device. So just in case anybody's wondering why that's there and you don't have that there, that's totally normal that you won't. Then also we're breaking out here and it's coming along and it's going down here and then it goes to your oil level plug which is just over there all right so also you're going to break out over here so coming along here we've got two long sections that come down here 
And this one then comes along and it plugs into your AC. So obviously the AC is going to function as per normal in this one. Nothing funny there. As long as everything is plumbed up right, you'll have AC no problem. Also coming out of here, we are going over to our oil pressure switch, which is just over there. So that's all nicely plumbed in over there. And then last but not least, coming down here, we go into our knock sensor, which goes just over there. All right. So that pretty much encompasses everything that comes down over here in this particular case. So that's nice and easy to go from there. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go back up. Oh, so old. Right, so we're going to come down along here now. So you can see it goes down along there. Then you have a little plastic thingy over here. And then it's going to like bolt in. It's going to bolt in over there. And then coming to the other side, you're going to see it bolts in over there as well. So that's a little plastic piece over there. Obviously when you're fitting the harness, all of this won't be on. So you pull this whole intake off and you'll have access to all of this. All right. Okay, so coming on to the injectors now. Oh, sorry, sorry. So the first thing that you break out over here is going to your oil control valve over there. Then it's going to come a little bit further along. And just before it hits the plastic section over there, you're going to break out for your noise filter. So you should have this little bracket on your engine with a noise filter there. Also coming out there, we're starting with the injectors. So we've got injector one and we've got injector two. Okay, so that's all good. So again, you'll see the colors are different. So how to differentiate it was you've got gray, brown. Look under there, I've got gray. Look under there, I've got brown. Look under there, we've got gray. Look over there, we've got brown. So when you're putting it on, just make sure that you have odd colors every single time and you'll be fine. Obviously the lengths dictate it as well. So this one is longer than this one. So obviously if, the, if you put this one over here, you're not gonna be able to put that one over there. It's gonna be too short. So that also helps a lot when you're doing it. So that'll decide your first set of colors and then you can just continue the thing from there, all right? Coming further along in here, and you can see just down there, there's a little breakout over there, and that's gonna be the other two injectors over there. So you've got number three, which is the gray one. You've got number four, which is the brown one over there. And what I'm gonna do, there's another section that goes underneath, but we'll come to that in a minute. But you're gonna come further along, and then you're gonna see there's a breakout coming out here, and that's gonna be injector five, injector six, your cam sensor over there, and your EVAP solenoid over here. So I've just got this loose so I can get access to injector five when we do the testing. So that's what's coming out this little section at the back here. Then out the back here, we've obviously got the gearbox. So you can see down over there, there's our reverse plug over there. And there's our speed sensor plug over there. All right, so that's all of that section there. Coming down to here now. Oh, I nearly missed it actually. There's another one coming out here and that's your earth. You've got two earthing points there and you've got one there. And this one pops out of this little one at the front here. I do apologize about that. Right, so coming down here, you can actually see the little plastic has a chute that goes through there. So when you are putting the plastic on, just remember to push all these plugs through that, through that cavity over there. But coming out here, first thing we're going to do is obviously we're going to go to our earth, which bolts on over there. Next thing is our ACIS valve. So what I'll do is, I haven't got a video on the JZ ACIS, so I might do one if you guys want. Just put some comments down below and let me know if you want to have a video where I pull this apart and show you exactly what it looks like. What I will do in the interim though is I've got a video on a 1UZ and a 3UZ that has the same same type of system. So I'll put that link in the top there and then you can see exactly how the ACI system works. So it's called Acoustic Control Induction System. It's just a fancy term for variable intake runner length. All right, that's all it does. All right, then coming down over here, we've then got our power steering pressure sensor. So all the IS300s came with these. The IS200s came with just an oil uh, power steering pressure switch. So in other words, like an on and off. Um, for idle up. Now, if you don't transplant all of the power steering lines from the IS300, you're obviously going to be missing this. So if you don't want to put it in, just take your IS200 map sensor, plug it in, tuck it out of the way, and that'll just get rid of the code for the power steering pressure switch sensor. Right. Coming further along here now, it's going to come down a bit and it's going to split over here because where it's going, let's just see if I can get the camera underneath there. There's another knock sensor there, like the one in the front. And then coming down there, you've got your starter solenoid plug. So that just goes underneath there like that. Right. So that's pretty much all of the wiring on this side over here. Relatively straightforward. Once you have the intake off, you'll see how relatively straightforward it is. Now what we're going to do is we're going to come down over here. And again, so this piece of plastic goes all the way across and around to there. First breakout's going to be in the middle here, and that's going to be for your coils. So again, you see you've got one plug there coming straight out, goes along a bit, splits out for the coil number, well, it's actually coil number three. Yeah, coil number three. And then it's gonna come a little bit more forward, and there's your coil number six, all right? So if you guys are wondering in terms of the firing order, it's actually quite weird. 
Um, this is actually number one, and it's number one because it's running a wasted spark system, so it's firing two spark plugs at the same time. So you'll see this coil is actually over cylinder number six, but if you follow its HT lead, it comes all the way to cylinder number one. All right? So what that means is six and one are firing at the same time, because that's the firing order. And then you've got this one over here. This one is actually, uh, where's it now, this one? This one is actually two, sorry, I do apologize, because it's got two and five, so two and five fire at the same time. And the one that goes underneath to number three, and the number three has a short little HD lead which goes cylinder four. So three and four are firing at the same time, two and five are firing at the same time, and one and six are firing at the same time. So when you guys are looking at your wiring for the igniter, just be careful, because that's classified as one, that's classified as two, and that's classified as three. So it's kind of off-putting, because number one is technically on cylinder six. That's where it gets a little bit confusing over there. All right, so that's gonna break out there. All the wires are only long enough to go to their corresponding coil. So if you put if you put that one on that one, obviously that one's not gonna fit away to that one, etc. So relatively easy to get right. Coming down along here, we're then gonna break out at this section over here. So this all bolts down here. First thing that's gonna pop out is your drive-by wire motor plug. So that's got your drive-by wire motor and your clutch support in there. So that plugs in there. It's gonna come further along here and break out underneath here. That's where it's gonna to go to your pedal position sensor or, or accelerator pedal position sensor. And then a little bit further along and you've got your lambda sensor. So this is bank two, four, five, six, sensor one. So bank two, sensor one, all right? Coming along here, we're obviously gonna have the harness come down here, break out over here, and I'm gonna just gonna get down now so we can see. Just move this paper out the way. Right, so it comes down over here, and then it's gonna break out down here, which is going to your crank sensor over there. It's breaking out to go to your alternator three pin plug over there, and it's breaking out to go to your lambda sensor over there. So this lambda sensor is bank one, one, two, three, sensor one, all right? So remember, we've mapped out the secondary oxygen sensor, so this one that would normally be in here, no longer relevant. The one underneath the car that would normally be there, no longer relevant. They're not gonna be detected by the ECU, you're not gonna get a check engine light or a code for them. All right, and then obviously you've got your alternator over here, so you just need to make a main power supply alternator that goes from here all the way into the car and up to the fuse box over there as well. All right, last section that comes out over here, it's just popping up over here, and it's going over to the mass airflow sensor. So um, we've done two videos at the same time. I'm just gonna briefly go over it. Basically all the IS-300s had this small sensor. All the GS-300s from 2001 to 2005 had this small sensor. The GS-300s from 98 to 01 had the big, what I call the bullet style sensor, exactly the same as a 1UZ BBTI. So just remember that. It can get quite confusing. Guys don't understand that on the GS there are actually two different airflow meters. Uh, everything else is exactly the same. ECUs look identical, but there are two differences that I've come across so far, and that is number one, different airflow meter. Uh, sorry, a couple of differences. One, different airflow meter. Two, no Tiptronic on the GS300 from 98 to 2001. Three, the 9801 had an oil pressure, oil, a power steering pressure switch like the IS200, whereas 01 to 05 had a power steering pressure sensor like the IS300. Now this applies to Europe. Obviously in America it was slightly different. The GS300 from 01 to 05 also got this wedge-shaped ECU. Uh, unfortunately in Europe we just maintained the rectangular ECU all the way from 98 to 05. That's what makes it a little bit difficult for guys when they're picking up engines from various vehicles and breakers not understanding exactly what the differences are between them. So, just bearing in mind. Best way to confirm anything on a stuff like this, get your ECU part number, put it into Toyo DIY, have a look there, it'll tell you whether it's a 90, a 01 to 05 or a 98 to 01 specifically on a GS300. I'm only bringing this up because obviously this is a GS300 harness, and the harness that we did actually get from the customer was from a 98 to 01. So we had to actually add in all the wiring for the power steering pressure sensor. And we had to rewire this because they have different wiring between the bullet style and this one. And if you plug the bullet style into this plug, the way it's wired for here, you're just gonna blow up the intake air temperature sensor circuit because you're gonna feed 12 volts straight down it. All right, so you will break the mass airflow sensors if you try and plug them in the wrong way. So be warned about that. Make 100% sure before you plug it in and power it up that you've got the correct mass airflow sensor. All right, so that's the complete layout. Hopefully a bit of useful information for everybody. And what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna get it fired up, I'm gonna get it warmed up a little bit, and then we're gonna go through and we're gonna carry out all the testing, which I'll go through on the sheet there with you guys in a minute. So let me do that and I'll be back in a second. See you now. 
Right, so now we're going to move on to the actual testing, which involves starting the engine, which hopefully is what you guys all enjoy. So, what we're we going to be testing, there is quite a long list, exactly like the other video we just did as well. Because it's plug and play, there's a lot of things that do obviously need to work, and we make sure they do work. So starting, the top section here is basically just testing with the ignition on, no engine running, but we're going to go through quite a few things. Starting from the top, we're going to test that the immobilizer is removed. So as you can see currently, we've got our little red flashing security light over there, move my finger out the way. Okay, so we're going to make sure the immobilizer is removed when we do it. We're going to go look at the ambient temperature. So that's this little temperature inside the vehicle. That's to make sure that, that is being sensed. So remember, the IS300 does have the MPX beam communication system, same as the IS200. So we are actually wired in and sensing from the ambient temp sensor. And that ambient temp sensor is the one that lives just under the bumper bar over there. So make sure that's plugged in. If not, you won't get any ambient temperature there. All right. Then we're going to go look at the lights on the dash, so it's going to be like the check engine light, the charge light, which is that one over there, and then oil light should be in the corner over there, so that's the three that we are looking for there. Then we're going to test reverse, so all we're going to do is bridge the reverse switch, and we're going to get the usual annoying IS200 beep, but that little beep tells me that the circuit from the plug all the way into the vehicle is 100% correct, so when you stick it in reverse, all your reverse lights and everything will come on exactly as we expect them to. Speedo, same old test as usual if you watch all the videos before. We're going to feed the signal down the plug right here. We're going to be testing that the 12 volts and ground are correct. Feed the signal in. We should see the needle shoot up. Then we know from the plug all the way to there, everything is 100%. So uh, what I've noticed over the last few years a lot of times is I think the speed sensors are getting a bit bumped when the guys are installing them. So one really nice, easy test that you can do at home with your harness that you've got to see if the actual speed sensor itself is broken or whether the gearbox side is broken. Basically pull the speed sensor out, leave it plugged in, take your drill, Tap, um, tape the gear to your drill and just spin it. With the ignition on, jump in your car. If you get a speed reading while you're spinning the drill, but when you're driving you get no speed reading, then it's a gearbox problem, not a speed sensor problem. So you can pull the back of the gearbox off, see whether or not that gear is making contact. All right, just a little useful tip for you guys. Next up, OBD2 machine. So this is a Toyota TechStream little handheld tester. So we're gonna plug this in. Now this is plugged in to the standard OBD2 port that's in the vehicle. Obviously this has been modified. So this would normally be in the plastic that goes underneath here, pointing downwards. But we are using the standard OBD2 plug, so there's nothing fancy, there's no extra plugs that you have to add in there, you just plug in straight away. Then once we're into the OBD2 machine, we're gonna start testing things. So we're gonna do the fuel pump relay. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna put a link at the top here. It's a video I go through explaining exactly how the fuel pump systems work. So it's a useful watch if you're not 100% sure, but it does explain quite a few things that you might come across when you are doing a swap like this. So number one, these things don't prime. They only come on when they have the start signal. So when you turn the key and the starter solar is kicking over, the ECU knows about it. There's a 12-volt signal going to the ECU to tell the ECU that you're cranking and it pumps the fuel pump. Then what it does is, as long as it's getting a rotational feed from the crank sensor to say the engine's rotating, it will continue to run the fuel pump, all right? So another nice little neat trick is, if you go to start the car and it starts and then it dies immediately, it could be a few things. It could be your math faulty, so it's always worthwhile checking codes. But if you don't get any codes and you're finding you've got a weird problem and it's doing exactly that, look at your crank sensor. So what you want to do is look at your crank sensor and make sure that it A is plugged in and B that it is working. Because obviously what will happen is if you go to crank the car, the ECU will power the fuel pump up. It will give it a little bit of fuel. And then if it doesn't carry on basically pumping, then it might be the crank sensor that defaults. All right. So just, just bear that in mind. Um, that, that is a way that you can just check as well. Next up, we're going to test the AC clutch. Oh, sorry. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to activate the fuel pump from the thing to make sure that the ECU is controlling the fuel pump. All right. Then we're going to test the AC clutch. So what I'm going to do is, again, I'm going to force the ECU to activate the AC magnetic clutch relay, which will then activate the AC clutch over there. All right, so that's telling me that the ECU is wired correctly and it's actually controlling the AC. So we're happy with that. Next up, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the data list. I'm going to press the AC button on the dash and it's going to tell me whether the signal has been received by the ECU and it's happy with it. So I'll have AC signal be on, it'll go off. Then I'll press the button, it'll go on, and we'll go like that. Right, so that's all the tests that we're going to do uh, with the car not running, just the ignition on. So that's nice and easy there. Then what we're going to do is we're going to fire up. So we're going to test the starter circuit. So again, what I mean by that is I'm making sure that when I put the key in the ignition and I go to start, the engine actually starts. So make sure that whole circuit is okay. Then we're going to do the drive-by wire test. So do remember, although you have a cable, these are drive-by wire. So if you listen closely, I'm not turning any throttle blade in there with that level of movement. So that is obviously controlled by drive-by wire. 
But as it's their early system, they put an over override in. So if I go here, and if you can hear that. But the last third, this is actually touching the drive bar, the actual throttle blade, but it's only opening it a tiny proportion. So in other words, it's kind of like a limp home mode thing. You can then do that, and you can actually open the throttle to get you get yourself home, okay? So sometimes guys say, oh, I've dropped in my car, um, I go to press the accelerator, nothing happens until I absolutely floor it. That's what's happening. Your drive bar wire throttle has gone down, and effectively, you're only moving the throttle blade this teeny little tiny bit at the end there like that, all right? Right, ACIS, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump in the machine here. The reason being is that this ACIS system, unlike the UZ, is at its rest position when it's like this. So in other words, it only moves when you rev it up. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna activate the vacuum solenoid valve via TechStream, and it's gonna move this from here, like that, down to there. Okay, then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna test oil control valve. Now usually by then it's quite warm, so when I do test oil control valve, it basically retards the cam and the engine's probably gonna die. It's only when it's cold and it's got a high idle that obviously it doesn't actually kill the engine and you just hear that lumpy sound. Right, then we're gonna go on injectors and coils. So what I mean by that, basically what I'm gonna do is I'm going to boom, 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 pull each coil off one by one. So do remember these two in the middle are only resting on, so if you do hear a weird misfire and you see me sort of pushing down in there, just trying to get those cogs to make contact again so that we can carry on with the testing, all right? Taco, so we're just gonna run over here, um, not the food taco, the tachometer. So basically that's gonna go up there and we're gonna make sure that we're getting that working correctly. Coolant temp, again, you might see the coolant temp when I turn the key on, because obviously I have run it now, so it is actually a little bit warm. All we're looking for is the coolant temp to come off the needle there and make its way northwards. Next up, codes and diagnostics. So I'm gonna to explain to you all the codes, diagnostic features of the system and how to carry out diagnostics. Right, okay, so. Let's start with the section where we're gonna put the ignition in. So to start off with, we're going to do the immobilizer. So what I'm gonna do is I'm ever so gently going to put this over here, and I'm gonna move the lights out the way so you can see much better. But there is your security light, and then all I'm gonna do is, let me see if I can get it all in one shot. One, two, three. All right, there goes out the light. Haven't turned the key to on yet, so, and if you, the keen eared among you would have heard that the actual EFI relay turns on when I put the key just in the ignition barrel. So listen, there you go. Right, so what it's doing is, you've got key sense switch in here, which provides a ground to the ECU. The ECU has a permanent 12 volt feed, which then it bumps through, gives it out to M-Rail. M-Rail turns on the relay over there, which then provides the plus B circuit. Plus B circuit runs all the way in here, and it goes to the little antenna over here so we can read the key. So, your ECU is reading your key before you even turn the ignition on, all right? So, little immobilizer tip for you there. And that applies pretty much to everything of the same era. So your 1UZ VVTi, GS300, IS300, IS200. So you know already immediately whether your security is working or not. Your light should go out straight away. Okay, so that's the immobilizer system. So we've got no flashing light. We're quite happy that that's working exactly as we expected to. Next up, we're gonna flick the ignition on. As I flick it on, there you go, we can see the check engine lights on. You can actually hear the drive by wire throttle motor buzzing away there. That's completely normal by the way, it's a step motor, it does that. So let's move over to the ambient temperature. There you go, 14 degrees. So again, that, that is sensed, so it will go up and down as it gets hotter and colder. Moving along, let's go over. So we're gonna do charge light, oil pressure and all of that. So coming back to our cluster over here, you can see we've got check engine light, we've got battery light, and we've got oil pressure light. I've removed the low oil level, but that will work because obviously we've got the sensor and everything hooked up. I've removed it because we do a lot of testing on here and a lot of like the old non bbti engines, they don't do low oil level. So, but that will work in your case, all right? The only thing you've got to remove is the TRC bulb because the traction control doesn't work because between an IS300 and an IS200. IS200 has TRC, which is a very um, archaic, simple system, whereas the IS200 has VSC, so that's vehicle stability control as opposed to just normal traction control. So TRC, so I'm gonna go on a rant. TRC just shuts the throttle down based on wheel spin, so that's why your ABS and TRC ECU are one, so it can pick up wheel spin because it knows what you know, it knows what the front wheels are doing and it knows what the rear wheels are doing. All right, so that's a very simple system. VSC, much more complicated. You've got things like your rate sensors in the center. You've got steering angle sensors, the whole nine yards. So it's just a much more complicated system and they don't talk to each other. So do remember to move your TRC bulb, otherwise it's gonna flash away for you. All right. 
Okay, so now we've done that, we've done oil pressure lighting, let's go to reverse. So all I'm going to do is exactly what your gearbox does, and I am just going to bridge these two together, if I can get it to play ball. And as I do, you get that wonderfully annoying IS200 reverse beeping sound. Right, so that's cool, happy with that, so I know from the plug all the way inside the vehicle, everything is working as it should do. Next up, speedo. So again, nice and simple, Hall effect style sensor. Pin 1 is 12 volts, pin 2 is ground, and pin 3 is signal. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put the ground in. That's going to tell me that all of the wiring is correct in terms of the 12 volts on the ground, so I'm happy with that. Okay, so I've just put my 12 volts and my ground in there like that. So remember when you're looking inside the plug, you're reading from left to right. When you're looking at the back of the plug, you're reading from right to left. But these are all numbered, by the way. Every single plug like this has a number on it. It tells you which one is one, two, three. Right, so all I'm going to do now is... I'm going to try and get this all in one shot here for you guys. I've been quite good at that the last couple of days. But there's the sensor. Ooh, there's some finger gymnastics here. All right. So you can see there, as I supply the signal to it, the speedo goes up. So that tells me that everything is A-OK. -okay. So we know all the wiring from this plug, actually from these terminals, all the way inside the car is 100% correct. Super happy with that. Next up, OBD2. So what am I going to do now? I'm actually going to, and I need to sort these lights out because these lights reflect so badly on you. I've already got it in because this machine takes forever to load up. So all I'm going to do is go system select, and you can see right there, IS300. So we plugged into there but it is picking up that it is an IS300. All right, let's go back into engine. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna test the fuel pumps. Oh, pump, sorry. And first thing we're gonna do is go into active test. I wonder if I can angle this up. Ooh. Let me try and do some magic here. Nope, that absolutely helps nothing at all. Oh, there you go. That might be, no, I think I made it worse. Right, okay, so if you have a look, there's fuel pump, relay and fuel pump. If you wanna understand why, you can go back and watch that video I put up there. But we wanna test the fuel pump. Go into enter. And all I'm gonna do is press the little arrow. I wonder if you guys managed to hear the relay clicking. So, I'm just gonna lean over to here. So remember, the fuel pump relay is actually called circuit opening relay, which is obviously explained in the video as well for you there. So one, two, three. There you go, so hopefully you can hear the relay click. And I know the fuel pump is being controlled by the ECU, 100%, everywhere expected. Right, so AC clutch, so we're gonna go back into active test now. So I think we're just gonna have to come in a bit closer so you can see. So right, what we're gonna do is AC magnetic clutch relay. So all we're gonna do is go into that. So again, we're just gonna activate the AC magnetic clutch relay output of the ECU. And as I do that, I'm just gonna keep quiet. One, two, three. Hopefully you can actually hear the AC pump is actually clicking in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold the camera there. Okay, so hopefully you can hear that, but you can also hear the relay in there for the AC magnetic clutch. So that's clicking in there, so that should be perfect. Right, so next up we're going to look at the signal. So for that we're going to go to live data. I'm just going to scroll until I can see AC signal and I'll zoom in so you can actually see it. Right, so now at the moment you can see I've got AC signal and it is off. It's going to come over here, press the AC button, the orange light is coming on the dash. And AC signal is now on. I'm just going to lean over here, smooth this is in focus still. Turn it off and there she goes. Right, so I'm super happy. The signal from inside the car is making it to the ECU. The ECU is seeing it, accepting it, acting on it, and I've activated the magnetic clutch relay from there. So as long as all the other conditions are met, like pressure in the system, and it's all plumbed up correctly, AC will work exactly as it should do, all right? Okay, so that's all done now. So now we're gonna move on to the starting part. Now the JZ is a lot louder than the UZ, so I'm gonna put my earphones on. Because at my old age, my ears aren't what they used to be, and I don't need to do any more damage to them. Right, so quick recap, starter circuit, drive-by-wire test, ACIS, we're going to test little valve over there, oil control valve, the engine will probably die as I do that, injectors, one, two, three, four, five, six, I'll pop them out, taco, make sure that's working, coolant temp, 
Well, you can actually see already that that is actually working. It's already off the needle there. And then we're going to diagnostics for you guys. So, nice and simple, jump in your car, turn your key. One, two, three. And there you go. So she did kill her up. So. take my air defenders off quickly stay there right okay so let's move on to codes and diagnostics so first thing we're going to do is we're going to put it back on i may have to start it up again because it's probably picked up a load of uh, misfires because we've obviously removed the injectors so let's pick that up let's have a look let's see what we got should be pending there you go so it's picked up all of those misfires that i did so we'll clear that out. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start it up twice because obviously normally a fault has to appear up twice before the system logs it as an actual code. So let's put my ear defenders on quickly. So again, you can see we've got zero codes at the moment. Killer, turn the ignition back on. Put that over there. Right, okay. So, in this particular case, obviously you've got the ability to use an OBD2 machine. You can also use those little dongles on your phone or whatever, and you can pick up codes and live data, etc. Bearing in mind, this is a Toyota specific machine, so I can do a lot of the testing, like the ACIS, like the oil control valve. That's usually not available on those little Bluetooth dongles, so please just bear that in mind when you do purchase them. Yes, it can give you loads of data. Yes, it can give you codes, but often or not, you're not going to be able to carry all these little tests that I do. All right, so that's fine. Now then, on the IS200s, you can usually bridge the two terminals to do like the Morse code effect. So that's basically you bridge pin 4 and 13. Unfortunately, with these wedge-shaped ones like the 3UZ, that functionality is removed. So when you bridge those two terminals, 
you won't be able to get the flashing check engine light codes so you are resigned to having to use a tool like this or a diagnostic machine to plug in and check your codes but as you can see from the remap we've got zero code so we've got no gearbox codes whatsoever you can clearly see there's no gearbox connected on here so that has all been successfully removed and that is wonderful because it's a much better way of doing it to actually remap out all of the data there right but you can still bridge those two terminals and I'm going to explain exactly why or how and how and why you would want to do that. So if you've got a two, an IS from 98 to 2001, you've got this little diagnostics box in front of this fuse box here. If your IS is from 01 to 05, you won't have this box, okay? So just make that sure that people don't think if they've got a 2002 and they don't have this box, I think something wrong with their car, perfectly normal for that. Now, because I've got my OBD2 machine plugged in there, I'm not going to do it over there, but effectively I'm going to bridge the two terminals over here with a piece of wire. And what I'm going to, what you are going to notice when I do that, is I'm just going to go over to the throttle body here. You're going to notice the tone of the throttle body motor is going to change. Right, so in three, two, one. Right, so you can hear that sort of loud pitch squeaking over there. Right, so reasons you would want to bridge that, number one, to put it into diagnostics mode. What do I mean by that? So effectively, what it does when you bridge those two terminals, whether it be in the OBD2 plug or in that one over there, if you have that function in your vehicle, it's going to lock the timing at 10 degrees. Why does it do that? If you come and take a look down here, you'll see you've got 0, 5, 10, and 15 degrees. And on your crank pulley, there is actually two marks, so you guys need to be careful. There is two marks. Find the correct one and put some white paint on there so that you can actually see with a timing light that you are correct. But essentially, all you got to do, get a timing light on your HT lead here to cylinder one. Get your timing light on. You can check the timing. If you think for whatever reason that the timing is moved or something like that, this is an easy way to check without having to pull all of the stuff off. Yes, you'll have to pull the cover off that goes on here, the little plastic cover, appreciate it, but that's all you have to do. You can literally put your clamp around coil one HT lead over there, get your timing light out and check it's in 10 degrees. Right, now then, with saying that, obviously you do not want to leave that wire connected while you're driving because you're only going to have 10 degrees of timing. And that is not going to be fun. You're going to have almost no power whatsoever. But you can always hear that funny tone from the drive-by wire throttle when you do engage that diagnostic mode. So it is a good little sort of telltale sign as soon as you do that. If you hear the note change, you know you're in diagnostic mode. Because as you can see, check engine light does not flash. So that's for the sort of European 3UZs, IS300s and so on. They just don't do that. I think also the GS300s as well. So once I started getting newer, they removed that functionality. Don't ask me why. It was re actually removed from the US models from way prior to that. So are they, we're just sort of catching up with the US market, I suppose, if you want to call it that. But yeah, so don't leave it connected. You're only going to have 10 degrees of timing and it's going to run like crap and you're going to think you've got no power and you're going to think it's major issues. It's not. It's just that over there. All right. So that's it. I've pretty much tested everything. I'm super happy. Everything seems to be absolutely fine. So what we're gonna do, Jamie, is we're gonna get this all boxed up. We're gonna get it off to you and then hopefully you can enjoy it in your vehicle when you get the swap done. For everyone else, if you do want any more, if you do have any more questions, obviously I've done two videos of the same harness in the same day. So there might be some things in the other video that you missed. So you might wanna go watch that as well. But yeah, any questions, comment down below. I do try and get them as much as I can. You can also obviously go to our Facebook page, message us there. My wife is dedicated just to getting the messages and she passes them on to me so I can answer them when I have time. So that's all good. And Jamie, let's get this off and get it to you. For everyone else, thanks for watching and we will be back again soon. See you.